Thanks. And thank you for the invitation to be here today. So as I'm sure you've heard by now, Zika is an emerging mosquito-borne virus that in its urban cycle is transmitted between Aedes species mosquitoes and humans. And Aedes can live in close contact with us. They preferentially feed on human blood. They can live in our house and leave to uh, lay their eggs in standing water outside human residences. As you also know, there are now understood to be other less common ways that Zika can be transmitted uh, vertically from mother to child during pregnancy, through sexual contact, and through transfusion transmission. So Zika historically is an African virus that was first isolated in Uganda in 1947, and then it caused a sporadic and poorly described human disease starting, the first human disease was recognized in West Africa in the 1960s. So from the 60s until about 10 years ago, Zika caused small and focal outbreaks in Africa and Asia. But as you know, uh, starting in 2014, Zika was introduced into the Americas. This is the current state of Zika transmission where all of the countries that are highlighted in orange are places where there's active Zika virus transmission. Uh, the virus has been introduced into 48 new countries and territories in the Americas. So you might be looking at the orange color of all of the continental US and scratching your head. That is, I think, a somewhat artificial representation and it just reflects CDC's uh, labeling scheme where there have only been local transmission in mosquitoes uh, in people that don't have a travel history to an endemic area in two places in the continental US. South Florida in Miami last summer where there were 218 clinically confirmed cases and then in Brownsville, Texas also last fall. Looking more close to home, CDPH has recorded that there have been 541 confirmed human cases in travelers returning to California from a Zika endemic area since 2015. You'll notice that the volume of cases parallels the major population centers. And the concerning feature here is that the counties that I've highlighted in the red outlines are where the invasive mosquito vectors, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, that have been historically implicated in Zika transmission cycles elsewhere are also reported. So CDPH and the Mosquito and Vector Control Districts of California with, with whom we work closely are concerned about the setting up the situation for the perfect storm, which is the establishment of local mosquito-borne transmission in the state. So here are maps from last summer in Southern California. On the left is LA and on the right is San Diego. And what you're looking at is the co-occurrence in space of either of the two mosquito vectors shown in the color circles or Zika cases in travelers shown as the diamonds. So what happens when there is a Zika case that's reported to CDPH, the mosquito and vector control districts go out to the case's residents, try to kill adult mosquitoes in the area, and then remove the standing water containers to eliminate breeding sites. So at UC Davis, my colleagues are involved in statewide surveillance of arboviruses that are in mosquitoes. So mosquito control districts send their speciated mosquitoes to UC Davis where they're pooled and then we test them by an RT-PCR for the three viruses that are endemic in the state that are human and animal pathogens. Those include West Nile, Western equine encephalitis virus, and St. Louis encephalitis virus. And now we also test in the 80s pools for the exotic viruses that we're worried about being introduced into the state. Those include dengue, chikungunya, and now Zika. So speaking of the media, um, which I think the, the panel was really uh, informative and related to this. So a year ago, the vector community was thrown into controversy when a press release was issued from a Brazilian group based on data that was not published, so not available to the scientific community, but that indicated that it wasn't 80s mosquitoes that were being found and in, infected in outbreak settings in Brazil, although some were infected. What they found was that there was actually a higher 
infection rate in Culex mosquitoes. So Culex are a different genus of mosquitoes than Aedes. So this was sort of unprecedented. Even though arboviruses can switch their use of vectors, such a large switch it was sort of unexpected. So what this called for in the vector community was to ask which mosquitoes are actually responsible for transmitting Zika. And this is obviously really epidemiologically relevant because if you want to target vector control without a licensed vaccine, you have to know which species are transmitting the virus. Because mosquitoes have different ecologies and different feeding behaviors, and they also have different distributions. So on the left, I have the, some stats for the two Culex species that are, are most abundant in North America. And then our, on the right, I have the two established Zika vectors in other areas of the world. Those mosquitoes also vector dengue and chikungunya. So you see 80s are more active in the daytime. They preferentially feed on people, whereas the two Culex vectors tend to feed more at dawn and dusk, and they have a more general host preference. One reason why it's important to know whether North American Culex can transmit Zika is you'll notice that their range extends much, especially for uh, Culex pipians, much farther north than the 80 species. So when that press release came out, a lot of the, the mosquito and vector control districts around the United States expressed a lot of concern in understanding whether there was a big host switch. So how do we know which mosquito species are competent vectors? As you know, there are hundreds of different mosquito species around the world. And to the naked eye, they look very similar, but they are very different. And they're not all capable of transmitting uh, human and animal pathogens. So there are four criteria that a mosquito species has to fulfill in order to be considered a competent vector. They have to be abundant, they have to survive long enough to transmit, they have to feed frequently on competent vertebrate hosts. So these are criteria that we can establish in field entomological surveys. The fourth criterion is the one that we've been looking at, which is that you can show in a laboratory setting that certain species are capable of transmitting the virus. So this is a cross-section of a mosquito. She ingests an infectious blood meal that goes into the mosquito stomach or the midgut. The virus has to infect the midgut epithelium and then disseminate onto the other side of the midgut into the open circulatory cavity of the mosquito in, and be in the liquid that bathes it, which is called the hemolymph, so that then it can infect the secondary target organs, which in the case of a transmission competent mosquito would be, include the salivary glands, so that the virus will then be excreted into the saliva so that when the mosquito refeeds, she transmits into a new host. So this period takes a certain amount of time in a mosquito. So the way we do this experimentally is we take viremic mice that have been inoculated with Zika and then are at their peak of viremia. We anesthetize them and then we present them to cohorts of female mosquitoes of the different species that we're interested in studying. Then after the period of time that the virus moves through the mosquito body, we tear off the legs and the wings of the still living mosquito and we inject the proboscis into a tube filled with liquid which stimulates salivation. So we're essentially milking the mosquitoes. So if we detect Zika virus or RNA in the expectorant, we know that that species is transmission competent. There's another interesting phenomenon that's been observed, which is that within a given mosquito species, there can be regional variations or geographic variations in the capacity for those mosquitoes to transmit. So there's also been interest in understanding whether Aedes aegypti from one place is also as transmission competent as Aedes aegypti from another place. So this data synthesizes the field of vector transmission studies where you can see groups from various different places have been collecting their local mosquitoes and then looking at the capacity of them to transmit. So you can see this data really confirms that Aedes aegypti from all over the world are capable of transmitting Zika, as is Aedes albopictus from the one study in Germany. Looking at the Culex data, you can see almost uniformly um, that not a single mosquito that was tested, and unlike in vertebrate studies, we have lots more mosquitoes, so our cohort sizes are often in you know, 50 or 100. We can say out of the thousands of Culex that have been tested from around the world, they're not transmission competent. Save for this one outlier study, 
which I think could be potentially really interesting. So barring any methodological issues with the paper, um, this could be a case that there is something different about these Chinese Culex quinquefasciatus mosquitoes that enables them to transmit Zika. Alternately, there could be something different about the Zika virus strain that was used in that Chinese study. It was an Asian lineage genotype virus, the same that's circulating in the Americas that was in a traveler returning to China. But overall, the burden of evidence shows that Zika has not shifted to use Culex mosquitoes as vectors. So most likely, what, what my theory for, for the data in that press release was that in the Brazilian outbreak, people were surveying all the mosquitoes that were around houses, and they were by chance just picking up Culex that had recently fed on viremic people, but they were actually just measuring the whole body. So they were looking at virus that was still in the midgut of the, of the mosquito, or viral RNA there. So another question that we've been interested in as you know, there's been a lot of curiosity as to uh, what and, and what factors have promoted the emergence of Zika now. So on the mosquito side, one question is whether the spread of the Asian lineage virus has been promoted by enhanced transmissibility by the primary vector in most places, Aedes aegypti. So to address this question, we took an ancestral virus in the Asian lineage from 1966 in Malaysia that was low passage. And we compared that in the vector competence experiment I described to you side by side with a contemporary Puerto Rican strain. And in related studies that I'll also show you from a group at Colorado State, they were interested in the relative transmissibility of the, some of the African lineage viruses with respect to the same Puerto Rican genotype strain that we're using. So they used a Uganda strain from 1947 and a Senegalese strain from 1997. So looking at our data that's on the left graph, so these are Aedes aegypti that we collected in LA, brought into the lab in Davis, and tested for their transmission capacity. What you can see is that between 40% and 60% of the mosquitoes that fed on the mouse were capable of transmitting between seven and 14 days post-feed, but there was no significant strain-specific difference. So this really refutes the idea that the emerging Asian lineage Zika is more transmissible than its Asian lineage progenitor strain. To go even further, if you look on the right side of the graph, where the CSU group was testing Aedes aegypti collected from Mexico, they actually saw that the Puerto Rican virus, shown in red, was significantly less transmissible than either of the two African lineage viruses. So in fact, the emerging viruses is, are doing worse in aegypti than the African lineage strains. So I want to devote the rest of the presentation to talking about non-human primate model of Zika that we've been developing. So the reasons for having animal models of infectious diseases I think are pretty obvious to this crowd, but we feel that uh, the placental and neurological development of non-human primates is closer to, the, to humans than that of mice. So we've been developing a model so that we can study pathogenesis, transmission, timing of infection, which you obviously can't do in human studies, clinical outcome, and then ultimately downstream, look at viral and host genetic determinants of pathogenesis. All together with the goal of developing interventions like therapies or vaccines so that we could either prevent infection or mitigate disease. So even in the last year and a half, the Zika non-human primate field has rapidly advanced, and we know a lot already. So I've divided these into, this is a summary of, of the published studies focusing mostly on rhesus macaques. And already this list is not exhaustive, because I've excluded um, synomologous macaque studies. But on the top, I'm showing you data from the non-pregnant animals, and on the bottom, the developing studies in pregnant animals. So if you inoculate a rhesus macaque with a Zika, they'll get a viremia that endures in the plasma for about three weeks, sometimes shorter, neutralizing antibodies starting on day five. Like most humans, they won't show clinical disease, but they'll shed viral RNA in various different fluids, and our viral RNA will be detectable in many different tissues. And in our studies where we looked at 
in our preliminary studies where we looked two weeks post-inoculation, there is a hemolymphatic tropism. We also saw that in some animals, there is Zika RNA in whole blood longer than in plasma. So the second batch of studies were using rhesus macaques for testing various different vaccine platforms. And they all found that each of these vaccines are protective and immunogenic and relative and safe, and that they uh, conferred sterilizing immunity. They also did some passive transfer studies and found that uh, that confers protection as well. So moving on to the pregnancy studies, which are more related to the data I'll present you today, there was an N of one study um, out of an Oregon primate research center where they used a pigtail macaque, which is a different species, but also an old world macaque. And they found that when they inoculated subcutaneously Zika virus into a GD-119 macaque, which means gestation day 119, which is equivalent to the third trimester in a macaque pregnancy, they observed that the fetus developed um, fetal brain lesions um, including a pendable cell injury, which is relevant to, because we found similar findings in our studies. And then in a publication that's not yet out, but is available via preprint, um, there's data from the Wisconsin National Primate Center, where they took four pregnant animals in their first and second trimesters and subcutaneously inoculated them with Zika. They observed vertical transmission in four out of four, but they didn't see any fetal brain lesions and they didn't see reduced fetal head growth, a characteristic of the human microcephaly that we're trying to replicate. So when we designed our pregnancy studies a year and a half ago, um, the efficacy of vertical transmission really wasn't known. And we figured that in a study where we only had four animals, um, we wanted to ensure infection of the fetus. So we decided, and I submit it's an artificial route, to inoculate the dam intravenously, but also at the same time intraamniotically inoculate the fetus. So following that approach, we obtained pilot funding from the California Primate Center, and we inoculated two first trimester animals and two second trimester animals. So the full term in a rhesus macaque is 165 days or five and a half months. So our plan was at near term, GD-155, so 10 days pre-full term, we would uh, necropsy the animals for extensive optimal sampling collection. And in the interim, we would sample more regularly in the acute uh, disease or acute infection, and then weekly thereafter until the near term. So the first thing we noticed in the first trimester animal inoculated at gestation day 41 was that the fetus died seven days post-inoculation. So the kinetics of uh, RNA in various different of the maternal fluids were really unremarkable compared to what we had seen in non-pregnant animals. The viremia was pretty short, but what the, the notable finding in this animal was that the viral RNA levels and the infectious virus levels in the amniotic fluid went up from days two to seven. We also saw very high viral RNA levels in all of the placental tissues that we collected, as well as all of the fetal tissues that could be differentiated at that time. Because in a GD41 or 47 fetus, it was only about three centimeters long. We found corresponding high levels of infectious virus in all of the placental tissues, but none in any of the fetal tissues. So this is an anomaly compared to what we normally see because in all the other fluids in our non-pregnancy studies, we see that there's generally a genome to PFU ratio of about 1,000 to 1. So this was obviously much greater. The fact that we didn't see any infectious virus uh, above the detection limit of our, of our plaque assay. So my speculation for that is that talking to the pathologists, they said that the fetus was in a severe state of degradation with autolysis. And the last ultrasound had been performed at five days post-inoculation. So it's possible if the fetus died soon after that, that it had been decaying for two days, which would have a disproportionate maybe effect on the virus infectivity, but not as much of an effect on degrading the viral RNA, which we still detected. 
But overall, we think that in this animal, the, the fetal death was precipitated by high viral RNA levels in the amniotic fluid and placental and fetal tissues. So next, uh, in these two animals, they progressed to near term and they were euthanized according to schedule. But in this GD65 animal, she, she developed vaginal bleeding at GD103, so about a month after the inoculation. And she birthed a viable but preterm neonate uh, two weeks preterm. So we tracked the head sizes uh, by ultrasound and we saw that the animal that had the preterm neonate tracked along the two standard deviation line below the colony average, meeting the clinical definition for microcephaly. But at birth, when we did measurements of the head with respect to the rest of the body, um, this animal was not abnormally small. So we think that this was just a smaller animal, that not a microcephalic infant. We tracked viral RNA levels in the, in the maternal tissues, and we found that they um, were not detectable by about um, three weeks, or excuse me, a month. And this parallels with what was seen in the Wisconsin study where they did the peripheral inoculation, where they saw that the maternal viremia was prolonged compared to non-pregnant people, like animals. It's also been seen in people. We saw a little blip in one of the animals 43 days after the inoculation. We saw the development of neutralizing antibodies starting on day five, um, IgM at a week, waning at six weeks, and IgG from two weeks. Looking at viral RNA levels in the amniotic fluid, there was this spike in the animal that, with the fetus that died, but then the other three animals, um, the viral RNA decayed over time, below the limit of detection in one animal, and just, just above it in this one. This is the animal that had the vaginal bleeding, and so the amniocentesis was stopped because we didn't want to exacerbate the risk for fetal loss. So I should also mention that we had GD match control animals that were anesthetized and sampled on the same schedule as the infected animals um, to control for any non-virus related manipulation effects. So we did an extensive tissue uh, sampling and testing from all of the fetuses and all of the dams at necropsy. And I don't have time to tell you the data, um, but I wanna highlight what we saw in the fetal and neonatal brains. So these are different uh, peripheral nervous or central ner nervous sec system sections, and we saw in all of the animals there was viral RNA detectable in some and sometimes many of the sections. We also did in situ hybridization with Patty Pesavento, a pathologist, and she found that there's labeling of neurons, especially in this animal. So the fetal tropism actually is different across the tissue systems in the fetus compared to the dam, where in the mothers, we don't see any uh, viral RNA in the CNS. So I'm not a pathologist, uh, but <clears throat> I want to show you two H&E slides. So this is the brain section from the control and the GD65 fetus, um, where there's a loss of ependymal cell lining in the uh, inoculated animals. There were foci of mineralization and increased cellularity that was not observed in the controls that were blindly read by the pathologists. They also noted that there was uh, the absence of neural precursor cells in all three of the animals that were also blindly scored compared to the controls. And so what we have here in just an anaphore study is a spectrum of fetal outcomes in the earliest trimester, first trimester animal, we see fetal death. In the other three, we see uh, no clinical growth signs of reduced fetal head growth, but we do see histopathological changes. And these parallel what have been described in humans, including calcification, neural progenitor cell death, and a similar CNS tropism. So we feel that although we don't represent in this small study, um, the severe outcome of microcephaly, we do have lesser neuropathologic changes consistent with what's been seen in animals, in humans, excuse me. So that pilot study has now uh, spawned many more studies that are currently ongoing. We're further developing the fetal macaque model with uh, R21 monies to Kuhn Van Rompe, the primary, primary collaborator at the Primate Center. We're presently testing the NIH vaccine 
that's a DNA platform that's currently going into phase two trials in non-pregnant people in Zika endemic areas. And our preliminary results in the pregnant macaques show that, they're, that this vaccine is going to be efficacious. And then together with the Blood Systems Research Institute, we have a transfusion transmission study in non-pregnant animals where we want to know how little Zika is sufficient to infect macaques, are the current RNA detection methods sensitive enough, and how can pathogen reduction technologies prevent transmission. I should also mention, because these animals are precious, we want to maximize the use of them every time we do a rhesus macaque study. So if any of you in the audience are working on Zika and have in some, some macaque samples, tissues, fluids, that would be potentially furthering your research, we're amenable to sharing, especially if you tell us in advance so we can make sure that the right kind of samples are co collected for your needs at necropsy. So I've shown you here that laboratory vector competence implicates Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus in Zika virus cycles in urban settings. Uh, this means that we can target vector control to those species and also hopefully reduce chikungunya and dengue at the same time since they use the same vectors. And then the macaque work shows that these pregnant rhesus macaques that are IV and IA inoculated produce a similar fetal neurotropism and neuropathology to what has been seen in humans. So we think this could be a valuable model for understanding human fetal outcomes. So last, I'd like to thank uh, all of the people who participated in this study, especially the group at the Primate Center, um, Anil Singapuri, who's my technician, who's been doing most of the Zika testing, and then uh, the two medical entomologists working on the project, Brad Main, who's here today and has a poster, um, and Jay Nicholson, as well as a PhD student, Cody Steiner, our collaborators at BSRI and Hologic, who's been, who has a um, very sensitive RNA detection assay, so they've been testing a lot of these macaque samples, as well as uh, our funding sources. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Thank you. Thanks, that was a great talk. Um, so one question about the first part of your talk uh, regarding transmissibility in, in mosquitoes. There was a paper I think published two days ago in Nature implicating uh, an alanine residue in NS1 in transmission um, with the more recent outbreak. Uh, can you comment on whether that alanine is present in the strain that you tested? I haven't seen the paper, so oh. what locus? <laughs> I'm probably not gonna know, but what, where was the strain from? Uh, they, they tested a number of different strains, um, but they compared it to the Cambodia 2010 okay. strain, which did not have uh, increased transmission. Huh. Um, well, I'll check out the paper. I, I haven't seen it, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's one the more. thing with Zika. You have to read about three papers a day just to keep on top of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one more question. Uh, are there any local species of Aedes in California that you found to transmit Zika? Yes, so we, okay, so technically, and I know this is probably semantics, but we call Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus exotic, even though they've been in the state and increasing in their geographic spread for up to 20 years. Okay, so I would, I would mm -hmm. argue that those are probably no longer exotic, but both of those occur in multiple counties of California. Um, I can go back. So even uh, Albopictus was reported two summers ago as far north as Silicon Valley. So all of the counties that are circled in the red are places where one or both of the 80 species that are Zika transmission competent occur in California. And in the vector competence data I talked to you about, we were testing low field generation mosquitoes from LA. Yes, uh, thanks for the talk. I guess uh, I'm really curious to know if, um, uh, in your studies with monkeys, if you have any insight into uh, uh, the impact of postnatal infection with Zika. 
so that's an area where there isn't a lot of definite data about, and I think people understand now that prenatal infection will cause birth defects, but right. what happens to infants or children who are infected with Zika, and even the CDC doesn't have a clear, they, 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 they're, not, they're not saying there's gonna be any impact, but I've talked to them, uh, the, specifically the, to Eric Zubian, and he, he said within the CDC there are a lot of debates about this, mm. so what is your research, or have you, have you found about what may impact that question? So to my knowledge, uh, none of the primate research centers, of which there are seven in the country, ha have done a study to ex infect a neonate or an infant, a non-human primate, but I imagine that's going to be forthcoming. Um, what we are doing in, in our study, and then I know some of the other primate centers are doing, is if, if the microcephaly or is the tip of the iceberg, and there are all these other lesser neurologic defects that could have long-term neurological development implications, we are in, you know, following the design where we inoculate the dam while the fetus is in utero, and then we, instead of euthanizing pre-delivery, we allow the infant to be born, and then we'll follow them for a period of time. And then there are specialists that can look at macaque behavior and associate that with neurologic defects. But that really, that still addresses the question of what happens when the mom is infected, not the neonate. Um, so I imagine once people start figuring out the most, I think, pressing question of the pregnancy, then they'll start looking at infant studies. And I, maybe somebody in the audience knows if there's ongoing human clinical studies in pediatric cohorts. I don't know. I imagine so. <laughs> I guess as a follow-up question, is there any reason to believe that it would not have an impact? Like, is there some fundamental basis to sort of say, well, it probably, the virus would not make it into the neonatal, uh, the, the, the postnatal, uh, um, you know, the, the baby, uh, baby's brain? You mean brain. congenital or the, the infant gets fed on by a mosquito? Yeah. Like, uh, is there any reason to believe that the infant should be fine? Be, you know, uh, like... Uh, well, if, you know, if, if Zika becomes like dengue in lots of places where dengue is hyperendemic, the most children get infected with multiple serotypes of dengue by the time they go to school. So if the transmission intensity of Zika is high, you, we could expect uh, infants or children to get infected. You're asking whether in immunological development they would be refractory or? No, I'm just I'm asking like, uh, is there um, any reason to believe that the, uh, the virus would, that the children would not be affected if they were, you know, in, I mean, they'll be infected, but not, uh, that, that there wouldn't be any neurological uh, brain damage. Uh, so, uh, and clearly when the Zika infects the, uh, the fetus, we see all these effects, but why is it that we don't see any effects when the, the you know, the... Uh, this, the supposition is that we will, but we haven't had long enough time to study it. Okay. Okay, any more questions? It's a lark. You probably know one of the big controversies is basically what is the source of how does the infection get maintained in pregnant women? Mm. So, and, and there's been the hypothesis that it's really the placental right. infection that drives basically periodic mm. exposure of the fetus, so the fetus eventually becomes infected. Right. And, th and that's been shown by some of the clinical data suggesting persistent viremia in pregnant women, but once they deliver the fetus, the viremia disappears, right. as if, the, but once the placenta is gone. So is the question is, is it the infected fetus right. or is it the infected placenta that's driving the persistent infection in women? Yeah, so um, I think that's an interesting idea. And, and so our studies can't directly address that because we obviously had infection on both sides. But in the studies that we're doing right now, we're infecting only the mother's side. And then I would love to do a study where we infect only IA. So then we can really see, to me that would be definitive. If, we, if, we, if the dam's never been infected and we sp see spill back into the dam, then we know that it's coming from the fetal replication. But on the placenta question, um, when we, so when we titrated all the virus in the viral RNA positive tissues from the dam, 
even at 100 days post-inoculation, the only tissue that we found infectious virus in, in two of the three animals, was the placenta. Okay, well, thank you very much for a great talk.